You know, God proclaims to Israel that he will go in and destroy the nations in front of them, and they're stronger than Israel. What are we to make of this? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name's Rod Hembry. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV. We are discovering from Genesis, or rather from Deuteronomy chapter nine. And as we do, it's going to be very, very interesting. Stiff-necked people, what are we talking about? Corey, what's going on? Well, today in our reading, Moses goes back and revisits the golden calf incident. And so that's what we're also going to do today. Ryan, what about you? Well, you know, we read a lot in the Bible about the heavens, but just what exactly does the Bible mean by heavens? That's what I'm going to be talking about today. Yeah, very good. That is interesting, Ryan and Corey and Janice. What did you do? It comes down to this. It come, that's it. It comes down to this. <laughs> Let's open up the Bible of Deuteronomy chapter 9 and hear what God says. Deuteronomy 9, verses 1 through 7. Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go in to dispossess nations greater and mightier than yourselves, cities great and fortified up to heaven, a people great and tall, the descendants of the Anakim, whom you know and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of Anak. Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you, so you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly, as the Lord has said to you. Do not think in your heart, after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, Because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me in to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out from before you. It is not because of your righteousness or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess their land, but because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 9 verses 1 through 7. We continue to read Deuteronomy 7 to 10 as Moses explains himself what he's learned from going through the wilderness with the people of Israel. And, uh, and we hear this because it's important. Now today, we're gonna focus on number nine. Israel was chosen by God himself to become a nation. We called Israel. So, as his nation, why would God describe them as stiff-necked people? Really? What does that even mean? Well, the phrase stiff-necked is used to describe a person or people group who are stubborn and unmovable. Some have replaced stiff-necked with bullheaded. That's, that's good. The idea is to describe someone who is unyielding for no good reason stuck in their ways, if you would, trapped in their own customs. God spoke to Moses, instructing him how to act and react to people and to things that happened. God desires us to move in his direction, not our direction, his direction, and not with our own ideas, with his ideas. Now, this is the problem that many have with the Lord. They want to move in their own direction rather than God's. Those same people hold on to God responsible for the bad things that happen in their life. God has did this and God did that. Hold on a minute. Remember that the Lord is showing us how to live. He's not making us comfortable so we can just do whatever we want and float through our existence. But God is demonstrating to us how to live. 
So that's how we need to think. We need to change the way we think. Now, when you look at television and you look at the internet and you listen to radio and you hear things and see things, there's something that we recognize. It's all about, well, you know, I want this, I want that. I'll be happy if I have this hairspray. I'll be happy if I have that. I'll be, if I just get this, if I just get that. And that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie, 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 lie. You won't be happy if you just get that. Your happiness is completed when you come to God. And when you come to God, then things change. Products are fine, but things change. Take your Bible guide and turn today to the pages in it. If you don't have the Bible guide, you can write for yours. The address is at the bottom of the screen. Canadian, American, British, it's all there. And you can call the numbers too and get, uh, get a hold of uh, your Bible guide if you want to. Or here's a good one. You can go to BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And when you click on the page, it takes you to a donate page. Thank you for making a donation. That's how we survive. But it also takes you to the PDF version. A PDF version is the version that looks exactly like this guide. And uh, it's in uh, paper form on your computer. And so then all of a sudden you have the guide. And it's great. Seconds. It'll take you seconds to get to us. And that'll be wonderful. So as we look at this, we're going to focus on the world's most important book, the Bible. And as we do, we're talking about stiff-necked people. What does that mean? Stiff, what, what, stiff-necked people. Well, this is stubborn people. Father, I pray today as we read about stubborn people, that you would help us not to be so stubborn. That you would help us not to be so stiff-necked. Help us to be people who hear you and follow you in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us to take your word and apply it to our heart in Jesus' wonderful name. We said together, amen and amen. Okay, look at the scripture. Deuteronomy 9 verse 1 says, Hear, O Israel, you are to cross over the Jordan today and go to in to dispose the nations that are greater and mightier than yourself. What? You are to dispose the nations greater and mightier than yourself. Cities great and fortified up to heaven. A people great and tall. The descendants of the Anakim, whom you know, and of whom you heard it said, who can stand before the descendants of the Anak? Therefore, understand today that the Lord your God is he who goes over before you as a consuming fire. He goes before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them and bring them down before you. So you shall drive them out and destroy them quickly as the Lord has said to you, which brings me to this point. God proclaims that he will go in and destroy the nations stronger than Israel. Listen carefully. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. Do we understand that? We don't have to do it, but we pray, God, help me to do it. We begin to do it. We take the steps, but it's God who goes before us, Christian. It's God who goes before us, believer in Jesus Christ. It's God who goes, Jesus has already won. That's what that means. Jesus Christ has already won. We just have to do what he told us to do, to take the step. Very important. Very interesting. Well, let's read on because this gets good. We're talking about Deuteronomy chapter 9, verse 4. It says, do not think in your heart after the Lord your God has cast them out before you, saying, well, it's because of my righteousness the Lord has brought me in to possess this land but is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is driving them out before you. It has nothing to do with you. It is not because you are righteous or the uprightness of your heart that you go in to possess the land, but it's because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God drives them out from before you and that he may fulfill the word which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Therefore, understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land to possess because of your righteousness, for you are all stiff-necked people. <laughs> Point number two, Israel will conquer Canaan, not because they're righteous, 
but because the nations are wicked, we are sinners saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. We are sinners. I am a sinner saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I'm a sinner saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, beloved. So if there's anything good in me, it's because of the Lord, not because of me. Keep that in mind. Now let's take a look at this last verse because this gets really interesting now. He says, remember, don't forget how you provoke the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. He says, I don't want you to forget that. He wrote it down in his word. From the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. Let me tell you something. This is something the Lord says. Rebellion is evil and bad. Rebellion is evil and bad. The Lord is merciful to us. So we must avoid rebellion. We must avoid rebellion. You know, it's easy for us to rebel. We can do that easily. Anybody can demonstrate. Anybody can rebel. But what about keeping your mouth or my mouth shut? What about keeping myself under control? Well, that's something that's different. That takes the work of God. There's no government or no place or no person that can do that. God himself is the only one who can control our hearts. So we come to Jesus Christ and we say, Lord, I need your help. Come into my life. I need you today. Well, in our reading today, Moses goes back and focuses in on the historical account of the golden calf. So when the parents of the people who he's speaking to in Deuteronomy, you know, he's speaking to the next generation of Israelites who are going to march in and take the promised land. Well, it was their parents who, you know, immediately failed uh, the Ten Commandments as they were being given to Moses. They were creating a golden calf idol. So let us revisit it just like Moses did and take a look at the golden calf incident and some of, uh, you know, it's, it's cultural basis. Take a look. Two major instances of idolatry in the Bible are directly connected with ancient Egypt. One occurred under the leadership of Aaron while Moses was delayed on Mount Sinai, and the other was initiated by Jeroboam after he successfully took control of a fragmented Israeli kingdom. These instances share the image of their idolatry, calves. Both took place during a vulnerable time of transition and so probably served to reassure and unify. So why cows? In the case of the golden calf incident during the days of Moses and Aaron, Israel had just escaped oppression in Egypt and had been traveling to the promised land, facing opposition and physical warfare on their way. They made a pit stop at Mount Sinai where Moses left them to go and receive instruction from God. When he didn't return, the people assumed him dead, themselves abandoned. They forced Aaron to make an idol for them to worship and inquire of for help. Why a calf? In the case of Jeroboam, who himself had just returned from taking refuge in Egypt, away from King Solomon, who had a price on his head, he was the king of a newly formed northern Israel. He had the allegiance of most of the tribes, but had lost the crown jewel of the nation, Solomon's Jerusalem temple. Jeroboam's answer was to set up two sacred areas within his territory so that the people would not travel back into his rival's dominion to worship or celebrate the feasts of the Lord. Again, Jeroboam's idols of choice were cows. 
While the full meaning of the golden cows may not be ascertainable, the connection with Egypt is likely not a coincidence. The ancient Egyptians worshipped a few deities that utilized bull and cow imagery. They had a sacred bull cult dedicated to the life and death cycles of the god of the underworld, involving cycles of worshipping, then slaughtering living bulls. Even more widespread was their worship of the cow goddess Hathor. She was sometimes depicted as a full cow and sometimes as a human with a cow's head or ears. The cow was seen as life-giving. She sustained life through her milk. It was even said of some pharaohs that they were nursed by Hathor. This cow goddess empowered, sustained, and imparted divinity to the king's rule. Due to Hathor's nature as a goddess of provision, it seems a natural possibility that in Israel's time of need, they turned to a familiar cult to rescue them, without a leader, in hostile territory, with vulnerable families. Likewise, Jeroboam needing to unify his people even further likely reached into his pop culture to provide an alternative. Justification for his apostasy may even have been pillaged from the imagery of the temple itself. The temple's bronze basin sat on 12 bronze bulls. These bulls were not symbols of God, but their association with the temple, strength, and even the 12 tribes could have paved the way towards cultural justification. So when we look into the incident of the golden calf, you can very easily see how culturally appropriate this would have seemed for the Israelites. It, it probably was just a natural, you know, outreach, you know, from their time of need, they were looking for something to help them. So it makes sense for them to fall back onto a cultural norm, something that they were used to in their life. It doesn't make it right, but it makes it understandable from a human point of view. So then once we understand that, we can look and see how it was that God responded to it, how it was that Moses responded to it. Uh, so these are all really interesting factors that we that we have to keep in mind as we're reading through the scripture, because like the segment talked about, this kind of thing is absolutely going to happen again. It's going to be several generations later. So at least this generation, you know, that Moses is speaking to here in Deuteronomy, they do not seem to have participated in any sort of, you know, golden calf or cow worship. But several generations later, uh, their descendants would once again. So this is an important lesson for us to learn as Bible students as we move forward so that we can see how the next set is dealt with. You know, it's interesting, Corey, I was thinking about it and the, the, the cow, it has been a long supplier of food for us, even today, milk and cream and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, uh, you know, just from a very practical uh, point of view, why certain animals would represent certain things to ancient people, just as they do to us today. We have different animals that we, you know, uh, give meaning to. So Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. Ryan, what's up? Well, you know, guys, we read a lot in the Bible about the heavens, and we see one example of that in our reading today. Specifically, I'm talking about Deuteronomy 10.14, which declares, To the Lord your God belong the heavens, even the highest heavens, the earth and everything in it. Now, the Hebrew word for heaven is semeum, and sometimes it refers to the natural heavens, and sometimes it refers to the abode of God. So today, I want to do a biblical study on this topic. What exactly are these heavens? Let's study. Many have pondered what the expanse or firmament of heaven is in Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. The first time the word heaven occurs in the Bible is in Genesis 1:1. In what appears to be a summarization of all creation, this verse records that God created the heavens or Shemaim in Hebrew, and the earth. But what exactly does Shemaim refer to? Though it appears 421 times in 395 verses of the Old Testament, it is a subject of a sentence only rarely, and thus its exact meaning has led to some confusion. However, the basic meaning of Shemaim is that which is above us. As such, it can refer to three possible entities, that being the first, second, and third heaven. Though this terminology does not appear in the Old Testament and is only briefly alluded to in 2 Corinthians 12, it is a convenient construct for our thinking. Simply stated, the first heaven is the near distance above us. Today we would call this the atmosphere. 
though the atmosphere was not a concept that ancient people would recognize. Clouds, birds, and precipitation are phenomena associated with this first heaven. The second heaven is the astronomical realm, what we today would call space. And the third heaven is the abode of God. The second occurrence of the word heaven in the Bible is on the second day of creation week in Genesis 1, 6 through 8, where the details surrounding its creation are given. Here, God creates an expanse or firmament called Rekia in Hebrew, and he names that expanse heaven or Shemaim. Thus, the expanse is synonymous with heaven. But what is this created heaven within the context of day two of creation? To answer this, we must carefully examine the scriptures. One key passage is Genesis 1, 14 through 19, where God places the luminaries in the expanse. Another key verse is Genesis 1, 20, where it is said that flying creatures fly across or upon the face of the expanse. Also consider Psalm 19, 1, which says the heavens, Shemaim, declare the glory of God, and the sky, Rekiah, above proclaims his handiwork. Interestingly, the two Hebrew words translated heavens and sky here are the same as in Genesis 1.8, though in Genesis they are translated heavens and expanse. Significantly, in both passages, these two words are equated. This is important because if the expanse or sky in Genesis 1.8 is referring to the atmosphere, then the subject of Psalm 119 must also be the atmosphere. But no one contends that the subject of this psalm is the atmosphere. It is obviously speaking of the astronomical realm. Thus, the expanse in question here cannot be the atmosphere. Based on this, the expanse or rachia of Genesis 1, 6 through 8 can best be identified by what we moderns would call space or sky. So it seems that the heavens within the context of day two of creation week can best be identified as what we would call space or sky. But in other contexts, this word, which as I said in Hebrew is semeim, can mean first, second, or third heaven. But keep in mind that these terms, first, second, and third heaven, while they're very convenient for our own thinking, aren't found in the Old Testament, and they're only alluded to by Paul once in the New Testament. So we should be careful about being overly committed to this construction, because after all, in the time period which the Bible was written, there wouldn't have been the same distinction between the heavens as we would make today, because the contrast between the atmosphere and outer space is modern. This can be seen in the Bible because as sometimes what we would call the first and second heaven appear to be blended together. But really the key to understanding what heavens means in any particular passage is to really pay attention to the context. Yeah, it's important we have to pay attention to the context. Very good, Ryan. Excellent. Jam? Paying attention to the context. I don't even know how to deliver this message today, except that in my New King James Bible, Chapter 9 is titled, Israel's Rebellions Reviewed. And I think, watch out, pride, because that's what happens when we think we're something that we're not. And a lot of us can forget about who we are. And um, in verse 6, it says, Therefore understand that the Lord your God is not giving you this good land, Israel, to possess because of your righteousness, for you are a stiff-necked people. And Moses reminds them again. He says, Remember, do not forget how you provoked the Lord your God to wrath in the wilderness. From the day that you departed from the land of Egypt until you came to this place, you have been rebellious against the Lord. And Rod, certainly there is not any of us who have lived life without being rebellious, without sinning. There is nobody that is without sin. We can say that we're the best person ever, that we're good. We can say that we do lots of things for God. We can say that we give God our money, that we give God our time, that we're nice to other people. But it comes down to this. It comes down to this. Jesus asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they answered him and they said, well, some of you, they think that you're John the Baptist risen. Some of you, some of them think that you're Elijah. Some of them think that you're a prophet. And then Jesus made it even more personal. And he said, who do you, who do you say that I am? And that's what Jesus asks us because Jesus said to us, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. We can't be good enough. We can't do enough. We can't give enough. We can't be enough. In a lot of ways, I'm a stiff-necked person. I don't like to be bendable and moldable and pliable all the time. I like my way a lot of the times, but that doesn't make it the right way. It doesn't make it the best way. And I need to remember that I come to God through his son, Jesus Christ, and what he did for me on the cross. And he gave his life for me. The least I can do is to give my life to him. And I'm going to mess up. I'm going to mess up just like the Israelites did in the wilderness. And I'm going to, sometimes I'm going to go round and around and around with those lessons. But I want to give my life to God and to seek after him. And when I know that I have failed, how wonderful to know that I can come back to my father and say, please forgive me and help me, help me God to learn and to turn my life over to you each and every day. I think that's really something that, that we have to come to grips with. Yeah. And uh, I've been talking about that in this time that we've spent together because I noticed there's a shift in a lot of the people. Mm. And, uh, but we need to come to Christ and we need to say, you know, Lord, everything around me has shifted my attitude, but I need you, Father, to shift my attitude towards you. Colossians chapter three says, set your mind on things above, not on things of this world. Help me to think about you. Help me to come to you. Lord Jesus, I come to you. And that's what we need to pray. And that's how we need to act because that's who we are. Now today, remember that we cannot control ourselves without the help of the Holy Spirit. We can for a little bit of time, but we really can. It's easy to rebel, easy to demonstrate, easy to do all these things. We must pray and ask God to help us. And so, Father, I pray today in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord, that you would help us. Lord, help me to align myself with you. In the name of Jesus Christ, this is what we pray, amen and amen.